There was a New York Times piece this week um, about a Charlotte private school, an elite school, and um, a young African-American man who was expelled from the school because his mother had just trolled one of the teachers there. But the way the whole article was positioned, you know, you would think that this this mother was like some kind of victim. And it all concerns her objection over the school teaching some of the greatest African-American literature that exists, which uses the N-word repeatedly, uh, specifically August Wilson's Fences. Um, but all that is lost as is the notion that the woman is objecting and trolling and bullying online, on social media, an African-American teacher. But you lose all that in the headline and the photo and everything and the whole angle of the piece. And the reason I mention all this is because usually we don't do on Man Listening topical kinds of issues. The, usually our conversations are evergreen. But it just so happens that I'm talking today to the mother of, of a teacher at the school, not the teacher who was bullied, but a, a friend of mine who teaches there who um, teaches African-American literature. He's not the teacher in question, but the issue of teaching books, whether it's Mark Twain or August Wilson or James Baldwin or whoever, um, in which the N-word is used, you know, I think it lends a certain, um, you know, added heft or gravitas or salience or whatever you want to call it to today's conversation. So just keep that in mind. Thanks. My students used to say, this is what white students used to say when I um, like taught the slave narrative. Well, I don't feel comfortable with this. And I go, um, excuse me, do you think the world care about your level of comfort? <laughs> what is the sound of one man listening? This is Man Listening, a fresh podcast featuring the stories of strong women who bounce back. Man Listening, because every woman deserves to be heard. Hi, I'm Stuart Watson, and welcome to Man Listening. This week, Ethel Smith, who's the mother of my friend Marcus Smith, and Ethel Smith taught African-American literature at West Virginia University. She did a Fulbright scholarship. You'll hear her say that she got a real hand up and a boost to her career by the poet Nikki Giovanni. And um, really, this is just a couple of people who are really, she and I are both baby boomers. Uh, we're not that far apart. I think she's seven years older than me. She's, you know, we're basically um, the same era, and we're both English majors, but after that, we have very, very different experiences. She went to an all-black public school in Alabama, and I went to an all-white public or private school in South Georgia. So we're a couple of Southerners who both love literature, uh, who both you know, share a love of uh, Marcus, uh, who are catching up. She was in Birmingham, Alabama, and that's all about you need to know about me going and visiting her. So, Ethel Smith. Where were you born? Louisville, Alabama, Barbara County. I it's, don't, I don't it, know where that is. Okay, so Barbara County, Alabama is the same place that George C. Wallace is from. Really? Yeah, so that's where I was born. <laughs> That's yeah. It's a population of about a thousand people. Is that south, north? Yeah, it's southeast. It's between Montgomery and Opelika. Gotcha. You know? okay. okay. Close to the Columbus, Georgia side. Yeah. yeah. Now, hospital or home, your birth? Oh, at home. And people didn't. Uh, uh, I think the next generation, like Marcus, they went to. We went to the hospital, but when. I was born, my sisters, I don't think people went to the hospital. So well, was, not black people, anyway. Was there a midwife? Yeah. 
And what, if anything, did your mother tell you about her pregnancy, labor, and delivery with you? Oh, nothing. She told all of us. You, all of you are unplanned. I just love you when you got here, but not really. <laughs> You know, one time you, you remember when people were going through that thing about being so distressed because their parents told them they were unplanned. It's like, all of you are unplanned. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I told my children. And my <laughs> wife told them all of them were planned. Yeah, you're yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so, yeah. And for your mother, your number what of how many? I'm number... I feel like I'm number one because my mother had two sets of children. So she had a daughter and two sons. And then I'm 10, 12 years, maybe 15 years young. The daughter died when she was seven. Uh. And then the two boys are like 15 and 12 years older than me. So by the time we came along, they were moving out of the house. So I grew up with my sister. I have two sisters younger than me. So I, we grew up together. Yeah. yeah. Are you close with them still? Well, yeah, it, it's, it's hard. It, when, when you're the person who leaves, they hold it against you, but then they're always calling you for stuff. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Why did they hold it against you? Oh, because you left. You, you, you were the one who left. Uh, did they stay here in Alabama? Yeah, they stay in the same. Uh, well, Lala, my youngest sister, is in Mid Midland City, which is near Dothan. Uh-huh. And she was married, and she was in Kanye's. I think Lala was probably married five times. I couldn't keep up with all her husband. But my other sister lives in the town we were born in. Yeah. And when you moved away, you moved where? So I went to school in Huntsville, and then I moved to Atlanta. Okay. To get a job. What, yeah. what was the job? Oh, I had all kinds of jobs. It wasn't. Somebody offered me a job and I moved. I moved and looked for a job. So eventually, I worked for Xerox in marketing. I worked for, oh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I worked for a lot of non They were all horrible. <laughs> they were just, it was just Just work. job, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, right. yeah, kind of thing. And why did you not want to stay in Alabama? Oh, I, I would have died first. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, there, it doesn't uh, offer you anything. Well, just imagine living in a town of a thousand people. That's hard. Yeah, somebody offered me a job one time in Tuscumbia, Alabama. And the population is eight. Oh, no, scholar. The population is 8,000. I go, no, I can't live in a place of 8,000 people. And I think they were all like white people. I was like, no, are you kidding me? <laughs> this will not be happening. I don't know. I go, oh, you could. And also, they taught, you had to teach a lot of classes. You, you know, like, oh, no, it was too much work and you didn't have any outlet. Uh, but so. That's a good point. So when you moved back to Alabama, there were probably some people in Atlanta that said, or in, for that matter, in West Virginia, not a whole lot of black people in West Virginia. Oh, so. no. But academic jobs are hard to come by. Uh, you, you see what I mean? So you, and Marcus was in college by then, so I didn't have to deal with schools and those kinds of things. So, so uh, how did you get from just just a job to a career that you really enjoyed? Oh, I always read books and I always read, even when I had those crappy jobs. And then uh, Emory University, we used to live near there. They used to have these continuing education programs mm -hmm. uh, and I used to take them. And that's, I, I wasn't particularly interested in John Updike and all those traditional white, but they were, so I read them. And then I, I learned stuff. And then I start, I, I, for a while I wrote for a little newspaper in my community. And when then you I- you say your community, what do you mean by that? Oh, I lived in um, Atlanta in the Druid Hills community. Mm -hmm. So that's where Emory University is. That's where uh, the Paideia School is, where Marcus went to school when he lived there. So one day, my friend Ann Warner, she said, uh, You've taken all the classes at Emory. It's time for you to go to graduate school. And 
And I go, really? Because all my other friends, when their kids were moving, graduating from high school and college, you know, going to college, they were getting married. And I go, I think graduate school is a better deal. <laughs> Yeah, I think all those marriages have come apart. But I'm just like, yeah, graduate school is a better idea. <laughs> Turns out you made the right call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I've got a fellowship to Hollins University huh. in Roanoke, Virginia. Neat. Yeah. So that got you up in the Virgi vicinity of mm -hmm. Virginia. Yeah. So then I didn't know anybody. So one day, oh, Marcus and I, Marcus was getting ready to go to Wesleyan, as a matter of fact. And I, we were unpacking. And I was listening to NPR. And they were doing an interview, and I go, I know that voice. It's so familiar. And in the end, they said, we'd like to thank Nikki Giovanni for doing the interview, and she teaches at Virginia Tech, which is like 40 minutes from Roanoke, where I was. So I said, wow. So I wrote her a letter, and she wrote me one back. And we've been friends for 30 years. So my first teaching job was at Virginia Tech as an you, instructor. You, what did that letter say? Oh, dear Miss Giovanni, I'm Ethel Morgan Smith, and I just, I'm black, and I just moved here from, uh, to go to school at Hollins. And I've been a fan of yours ever since. Uh, I would love to meet you. She wrote me back and invited me to her class. And then she recruited me out of grad school. So I taught there three years. Yeah. So that was like a hand up. Was yeah. Like, oh, that was, I was so, it was like, whoa, <laughs> you know, but I wrote, a, I didn't write just her. Rita Dove, the poet, had just moved to UVA. But she, we probably had moved because she sent me a note and said that her, she had boxes everywhere and she would send me her schedules. So if I wanted to go, Paul Ma, she was in Richmond. So there were a lot of write, you know, black women writers around. So I wrote a lot of letters, but Nikki wrote back. <laughs> That's wonderful. And you'll never forget that. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. But she writes letters, you, you, you know, like a friend of mine in California sent me a letter. She had been working with this, this guy who was incarcerated. And she said, well, he said he used to write Nikki and he lost her address. So I said, well, send it to me. I'm going to go over there in a couple of weeks. And she did. And so I said, Nikki, here's a letter from you. This guy said he, he used to write to you. And yeah, she said, oh yeah, let me just write him now. So she just sit down and write him now. Yeah. She, she writes a letter. Wow. To everybody. When you were a little girl, what kind of stuff did you read? How did you learn to love to read? Oh, we had, in spite of living in the black belt of Alabama in segregated school, we had these fabulous teachers who were so vested in us. So my childhood friend who lives here is a physician. So her mother, her aunts, her dad, they all taught us. So Mrs. Handy lives in Huntsville. She's 92. She was my third grade teacher and she remembers me. She takes yoga classes and if I don't call her, she'll call Sandra and says, where is that Ethel? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so her husband was Dr. Handy, who's the grandson of W.C. Handy. Oh my word. I know. So when Dr. and so my friend, my childhood friend is the niece. Her mom is Mrs. Handy's sister. So Sandra said, when uh, Uncle Hayward died, that's Dr. Handy, he left in his will that no one could get money until they learned to play an instrument. <laughs> so Sandra said, I'm a doctor, that doesn't go for me. <laughs> <laughs> so on her 90th birthday, the, every, all the kids, one is the pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. And they came, they all came and played instruments for Mrs. Handy on her 90th birthday. So that was pretty grand. Oh, yeah. that's lovely. But yeah, so I had another teacher. Uh, I had one white teacher in, Ellen, in, in high school. Her name was Mrs. Duck. She was British. And I, I can imagine her husband doing the war, telling her what a charming place it was. <laughs> you know? It was about no crime. Yeah, I can just see, hear that Sold story. Sold her a bill of goods. I know. She didn't know she was going to teach black kids. But she was quite fun. Uh, and she liked me. And so she would give me books because you couldn't, we didn't go to the library to check out books. Uh, what, what kind of books would she loan you? 
Oh, just Would she give them or loan them? No, just chuck them out of the library for you, know, that kind of thing. So that got me into. And so like what? what would she oh, the, the, the Catcher in the Rye, Animal House, those kind of books. The classics. Yeah, the classics. Uh, I remember there's, she did Macbeth. We, we had Macbeth. And this poor kid, I, he's probably dead now, uh, Freddie Clark. Oh, so her question was, what was Lady Macbeth holding in her hand? So Freddie Clark said a flashlight. She just went nuts. <laughs> <laughs> a flashlight, a flashlight. <laughs> I bet it scarred Freddie Clark for life. <laughs> Are you telling me you couldn't go to the library and check out books? No, no, we could not. Yeah. So what you're saying is, you grew up in a totally segregated school system, and not only that, yeah. they would not have given you a library card. Not downtown. You could check out books in the library, but our library was so uh, deficient because we didn't get new textbooks until, um, oh, I know what happened. George Wallace decided he had to give the black people something because they had gotten a right to vote. So. I don't know, maybe I was in the ninth grade, but that was the first year we had gotten new textbooks because our parents would go and fish them out of the trash can where the white kids threw them. They couldn't put them in a box and leave them at the door. That was like too, too good to be true. So they'd toss them and they would write through them, good luck niggas, you know, that kind of stuff. But our parents would clean them up, you know. So when I tell this story, people go, oh, I, I go, we just thought they were evil and crazy. We, 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 so our homemade teacher would come and we, they would wrap those books and newspaper and brown paper and put flowers, stencils on them. Oh, we were thrilled because that wasn't our shit. <laughs> that, 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 was, <laughs> that was totally them, you know? We didn't take that burden. We, we had the high ground, you, you know? No one I know has ever taught us to hate. No, you know, they'll just walk around and say, Lord, have mercy, and that kind of stuff. Did any of the people in your home read? Uh, no, th no. You, so you loved it, like you took yeah. to it. You, you had a... Uh, yeah, you, you and I used to teach to Sunday school, uh -huh. and I also used to write letters for people in the church, uh, like if they had relatives up north or sometime in prison. How old were you when you were writing these letters? I don't know, not that old. Maybe in the eighth or ninth grade. Was there some kind of heavy stuff that you had to... I don't know, and they would give me a quarter if they had it. But no, they would just be, I hope you're fine. Somebody had a baby. The baby has a big head. You know, <laughs> the, the flowers were pretty this year. We had a good garden. This is that kind of stuff. <laughs> did, did you ever meet George Wallace? Have you ever laid eyes on him? No, but I'm friendly with his daughter, the one who just wrote a book on, on Facebook. I'm friendly with her. Uh, Do you feel like, I feel like in the South, there are three sort of big races that I think about. Okay. Of a certain era. Okay. George Wallace. Mm-hmm. Jesse Helms mm -hmm. and Strom Thurmond. Well, they so, were the three evil people. Well, they, they were the ones of my generation yeah. that I think about. Okay, and Jesse Helms and Strom Thurmond kind of went to their graves. What? Yeah. I mean, what racism? We weren't racist. Whereas George Wallace... Well, Strom Thurmond had the daughter. Right, yeah. he did. Mm -hmm. But George Wallace got shot. Mm-hmm. And it seemed like it changed him. Did, am I making that up? Well, of course it would change. Did you not see the interview that Spike Lee did with him? I'm sorry, I did not. The, okay, it's an interesting interview because George Wallace is going, John's my best friend. And Spike Lee said, well, is it because he wipes your ass every day? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just my best friend. It's really pitiful. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's an interest, yeah, Spike Lee and uh, George Wallace. It's very interesting. Well, yeah. I have to ask this. What's it like living in Birmingham now? Because it doesn't... Oh, d d living downtown is great. There's a built-in social life. So when I moved in, this woman came and she said, Hi, we're Lisa and this is Mike Perez. And we're so glad you're moving in. 
and uh, every Wednesday night we go to the wine loft, which is right at that corner on 22nd, and then that's how you meet people. And it, it is, it is how you meet people, all kind of thing. But also, you know, when you're a black person and you're around white people all the time, you have to like not be their Negro kind of thing. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, like the magical, the, the magical. Yeah, so one day, oh, so they were doing this cookie bacon thing which I don't do, but anyway, they said, oh, come, it'll be fine. And, you know, so they said, well, Ethel, one of the things we do is we tell stories about when we were growing up at Christmas time. So why don't you tell one? I said, okay. I said, my mom said she would never, ever let us believe that some fat white man gave us some presents. <laughs> <laughs> And how did that story go over? You should have seen them. They wanted a Negro story. And it was like... <laughs> well, that was a Negro yeah, story. Yeah, exactly. A Negro story. But they didn't want that one. They, they wanted, you know... <laughs> you know, it was like, okay. You, you, be careful what you ask for. You know? So you, you got a little too real. Oh, uh, yeah. You ask. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, that's um, funny. So when you taught... At West Virginia University, mm -hmm. it was overwhelmingly white, was it not? So you. Were... Oh yeah, it, it's. Here's the thing, fifty percent of the students are from out of state, because you know it's thirty-five thousand students, so the state is under two million, and there are other colleges. So if it was just the state, so you had students from New Jersey, from Mar who didn't get in anywhere else. You know, and that's not so far away. Uh, yeah, when I first went there, if I saw an African-American student, it was usually a football player. And then I went away. I had a Fulbright to Germany. And I came back, and things looked different. So that was interesting to me. And what, what, what year was that? What had happened to make it uh, Well, different? they had more uh, students of color. Was that um, intentional on their part, or probably? I, I don't know. Um, what class did you teach? What was it? Oh, I taught in the Department of English. I taught Creative Writing and African American Lit, and and other kinds of lit too, uh, kind of thing. But mostly that's what I taught. So, what's what would a syllabus look like? What authors would you? Uh, I always teach uh, a Toni Morrison. I always teach a James Baldwin. I always teach, so who else do I teach? I try to teach different geographies, like Alice Walker is the South, Tony Morrison is Ohio, you know, that kind of thing. Ernest Gaines, I did a, a fellowship at the Ernest Gaines Center in Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, because he is so good and so Southern, but it's Louisiana Southern, it's not Alabama Southern, you know, which is a different kind of Southernness. Do you ever have friends from New York or the Northeast United States, and you try to explain to them that Alabama and Mississippi are not the same place? Have you ever had that kind no, of? No, my friends, I have lots of New York friends. They're pretty, uh, they don't say Alabama quite right. Here's Ethel, she's from Alabama. <laughs> Here's Jan, and she's from the Bronx. <laughs> do, do you think they understand the distinction between like, let's say, music from Memphis and music from... Mississippi. Yeah. Deep like Mississippi. Carbondale. Yeah. 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 I think so. New Yorkers are quite sophisticated, so my New York friends do. I have some friends from Minneapolis who did this whole big musical tour. They went... I'm trying to think. They came here on their way to Memphis, and they came from Carbondale. They just had made a tour of music and that kind of thing. Yeah, but not all my friends care about music. You know what I mean? So I have a friend named Fran. She lives next block. So we walk at 6.30 in the morning. So Fran has been here two years. She, she's African-American. So Fran said, you know, Ethel, when I first moved here, they kept saying, do you know Ethel? Because they always think all black people know each other. She said, <laughs> she said, she said, I told Pep. I bet Ethel is black. They keep asking me, do I know Ethel? <laughs> so we met. She said, see, I told you. So, so we got invited to a party last weekend, and it was very nice. It was in a big lobby and that kind of thing. So they thought they were really doing it. So they were playing, oh, you're going to be so happy. It's in the 1960s music. 
Not one of the stuff they played was black. And it, we just, I text, I text Fran and said, what's, the, what's with the music? She said, I almost laughed out loud. When you, so I guess, you know, Aretha Franklin. None Kingsville, of that. Motown. And they were, they were so proud of themselves. And it was like, really? It, we just, and they didn't even think about it. It didn't occur to them. They were doing the Beatles and Nancy Sinatra and whoever else. And we just kept waiting. Okay, something's going to come up. Aretha's going to come up. Some, somebody's going to come up. Smokey, you know? <laughs> Little Stevie Wonder. You know, we just... <laughs> but it didn't... Now, that wouldn't be all of my white friends. Like, I have... I'm friends with Bob and Pam. He is music. Actually, you know who's more knowledgeable about American music than most of my German friends? They send me music. Uh, yeah. I send them books. So, yeah, they are more. Well, if I checked out your playlist right now, what, what's on it? What do you listen to now? Do you listen to the old stuff or do you listen? Oh, to now it's Christmas time. Marcus hates my Christmas music. <laughs> Does, has Marcus introduced you to anyone that you were like, okay, that one, I really. Oh, yeah, a lot of times. Like, uh, who's somebody that. Marcus introduced me to? Leon Bridges. Uh, somebody I didn't get. The guy got a Pulitzer Prize, Lamar, somebody. Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you didn't I, like that? No, I didn't like it. I didn't know why. I did not like it. I didn't know why he got a Pulitzer Prize uh, oh. for it. But anyway, uh, some of the newer, the newer people uh, yeah. kind of thing. Interesting. I, yeah, if I ask Marcus about it. He, yeah. Does he ever consult you about the curriculum he teaches in high school English? Sometimes he doesn't consult me. He talks to me about it. And when I make suggestions, I may see it later or something that come up. Where are you with the Invisible Man? That's one of his. Oh yeah, that's a. You know, those kids are lucky. Those are big books. The Invisible Man is one of the best books. Did and he it, tell you about the little flap they're having right now? Yeah, yeah, which is ridiculous. Uh, they got a parent. Yeah, Miss Crazy Woman. I know who she is. <laughs> well, but I mean, it's more than one because she's co-opted. But the, she is co-opted with the, the liberal, fragile, the yeah. fragile white people who, yeah. who want to take the N word out of all of it and like August Wilson's fences. Well, and... the thing is, Miss Crazy Woman should read those texts for herself. Yeah. The, you know, like when Marcus was in school, I read. Uh, he would have reading lists. I read all of his texts, uh, just because. It's a smart thing to do. And so she thinks her daughter's going to go to Stanford and, and, and they're going to take out the N-word. Does she think anybody cares? My students used to say, this is what white students used to say when I um, like taught the slave narrative. Well, I don't feel comfortable with this. And I go, um, excuse me, do you think the world care about your level of comfort? <laughs> <laughs> sweetie. <laughs> You didn't say snowflake. Did <laughs> no, 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 sweetie. Do you think? <laughs> Isn't the whole point exactly to learn? In if you're order comfortable, to, to be uncomfortable. But that's what learning is. You, you know what I mean? That, it, it's like, whoa. Now the Germans are some of the best people I ever taught. No German would come to your class without reading your text. They, it was just marvelous uh, teaching them. Yeah. yeah. Rosemary said, well, that was because you were there. And I go, well, I don't think so. I think that that's what they do. What is it they saw? What, what were they trying to say when they said that's because you were there? Oh, that I was a special guest. I was a Fulbright scholar and studying African American, uh, teaching African American, lit, and they were interested in it. Oh, you're talking over there. Over there. Uh -huh. Not the exchange, not, not German students here. Oh, it's no, when oh, over there. Ger teaching there. And when you were teaching there, it was probably 100% white, wasn't it? Yeah, there was some mixed race. Uh, ah. When you teach in college, when you're in college towns, you get some mixed race people. Tina Bach, her mom was German and her dad was Nigerian, I think. It depended on where I was. And to begin, I didn't see any. Well, for me in my life, race, uh, uh, class is a much bigger deal than race. What do you mean by that? I think, like, how did that manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself in your interests, your education level, and, and all, that kind of thing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what kinds of opportunities, just to ask an open-ended question, what kind of opportunities has Marcus had that your siblings did not have? Well, 
My, not my siblings, but my siblings' children. Okay. So my niece, who's a, she's a little bit younger than Marcus. She, I got her a full scholarship at the Asheville School in Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. Lovely place. One of my best friends lived there. But, you know, she stayed there two weeks and she started crying. She was homesick. And, was uh, she the only black student there? No. Oh, okay. Oh, she's just spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? She's just spoiled. But, I mean, what, what does class have to do with that? What happened... What do you, what's the difference between her and Marcus? Because Marcus went to the Northeast. He was way away from Mama when he was ten, in 10th grade. And he seemed to have it, it like taken off education. Oh, well, Marcus always knew that he was going to go to school and stuff. You, you know what I mean? He, he, it wasn't going to be, oh, I'll take a gap year. He, he knew what the deal was, that my goal was for him to get a good education. And that takes care of some of the problems uh, with black people. Doesn't take, you still can get shot down by the police, but education takes care of some of the problems, especially prestigious education. You know. Well, for one thing, well, talk to me more about, there's, there's a book that was taught to Catholics and Jews who came, white Catholics and white Jews, uh -huh. who came from the northeastern United States to Alabama, to deep south Georgia, mm -hmm. the places where you, you and I grew up, as part of the Freedom Riders or the first voting, mm -hmm. uh, voting rights campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that book was called Class and Cast in a Southern Town. And I think a lot of people just conflate if you're white you've got money and if you're black you don't have money but now in places like georgia and alabama it's it's all jumbled up well that's that's exactly right so if you go back to let's go back to faulkner right in faulkner's world there were three class of people there were aristocrats who was anybody who owned land, never mind what the land was worth. And there were white trash, and then there were niggas. That was the three class of people. Okay, so Flannery O'Connor comes along next, and she confuses it all in her story. One of her stories, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Anyway, the gist of the story is, there's a white woman who's been evicted from her apartment, and she's standing outside with her stuff. There's a black man who's a dentist in a Cadillac, and he stops and said, can I help you? And she says, you can drive whatever car you want. You still a nigger and I'm still white. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that confused things. That's the class stuff. The, 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 the dentist who had the car had to said that. It wasn't the, the classes had changed uh, kind of thing. So yeah, so that's how the world is, and it keeps it keeps changing. And I, I think what young people don't understand is that the struggle is never over. It is always a fight. And they have been, young people are very spoiled. They, they are just so terribly spoiled. And I don't know why. What, what, what can be done now in the classroom to help these teenage students navigate a kind of a new era. How can... Well, their parents could get involved and not, <laughs> parents would call, I, I remember one time, it, it was my second year of teaching, I think. I get this phone call from this parent. And I said, really? And she said, my son said you gave him an F. And I said, well, let me get my roll book. I said, your son came to class five times last semester and he didn't take any exams. She said, but we paid the money. And I said, you should be having this conversation with your son, not me. But can you imagine parents in high school, you know, but college? I had another student, an Indian student. She was getting married, so she missed one day of class. And I changed, and on my syllabus I put um, subject to change. So I'm teaching something, and the students didn't know what a shack was, you know. So 
we went to the library and saw a film with Shaq's in him. So she did, she wasn't in class. So she comes back and calls her dad, tells her dad, who's a doctor, that she went to class and she couldn't find a class and she doesn't know what was going on and she's crying. And I go, well, she doesn't know. Of course she doesn't know what's going on. She didn't come to class yesterday and she didn't ask anybody. I can change whatever I want to. It's my class. Um, but yeah, but because her dad was a doctor, he's calling and making all these demands. It's like, don't tell me what, don't ever tell me what to do. And, you know, I, I had a fight one time with my chair. He wanted me to change a grade and I said, if I change a grade, I'm out of here. This is not the place for me to be. I said, these students, they don't get interested until it gets test time. And then they come, well, can I do something for extra credit? Can I write a paper? No. If you had written a better paper, you would have a better grade. No. I, but I, surely you came across students who were like you and like Marcus, that they took to it like a duck to water, that they oh, would yeah. read it anyway, that oh. whether it was a test or not a test, they just wanted to learn. Well, you know who the hardest working students were the African students. It used to be the hardest working with the Asian students, not the African students. The, because? Uh, I think they probably think they have more to lose. But if they're here, they, somebody has some money in their family. Uh, so, so like this kid, he was an engineer major. And he, he's from Nigeria. He said, oh, Professor Smith, I love this class. It gives me a break from engineering. I said, well, don't drop it. Just just stay. And he did. And he said, I'm so happy I stayed. Uh, but they, they are very aggressive and, and very, they're the hardest working students. Who was a teacher in your life that they said something or did something that was instrumental in your personal education? Oh, all of them. No, but if there had to be one, if there was somebody who did something and it just clicked, this person did this for me. Yeah, I don't, oh, one time, how old was I? I was 12 or 13, and I'd read Gun with the Wind, and I don't, I don't, I'm sure I didn't understand it all, and so I was telling people about it, and then people didn't know what I was talking about, so I stopped telling people about it, but then my English teacher wrote me a letter and said, that is a monumental accomplishment. <laughs> and it was, it came in a mailbox, it was on blue stationery, and that was, it was like so, I, I just probably read it 10 times, you know. So that was great, I remember that, yeah. Why were you reading Gone with the Wind? Was that a sign? No, but it was a book everybody talked about. Uh, now what did you make of Gone with the Wind? Oh, I thought Melanie was the good person. None of them are good people, really. Uh, you know, it's sort of like reading To Kill a Mockingbird when you're a certain age, and then you read it as an adult, and you go, yeah, it's a horrible book. <laughs> you, you, know? <laughs> you know, they forget about Tom Robinson. He died. He was shot. You, you know, it was like, ugh. <laughs> and then when she came out with the second one, Harper Lee, I don't know who wrote it, she or her lawyer, but then she gives you a different version of Atticus, you know, which probably makes more sense. Yeah. yeah, because she said when she took that book to New York, they worked on it two years. Wow. Which is sort of disparaging. You think, oh my God, she wrote that. Because she was always in competition with uh, Truman Capote. Yes. And she got the Pulitzer and he didn't. And yeah, oh, yeah. That's really quite something. Yeah, yeah. And you gotta wonder, a hundred years from now, uh, will we be reading James Baldwin? We'll be reading Kendrick Lamar we'll, and listening to him. Will we be reading uh, uh, Gone with the Wind? Or is that sort of of a period? Like, well, Gone with the Wind has had a long period. Yeah, oh yeah, I'll it, say. It has had a long period. You know, James Baldwin was not well received by African Americans because of his sexuality. So when I started teaching in the 90s, people weren't teaching him. And I think by 2000, people started to teach him again. Uh, this commentator on MSNBC, Eddie Glout, he, has, uh, he teaches at Princeton. He's uh, the head of the African American Studies program. He has a book about his relationship with uh, Baldwin, his intellectual relationship, is called Begin Again. Yeah, 
And it's very good. It's very interesting. I've heard this guy. Yeah, yeah. It was good. No, oh, Baldwin was great. You know, and the students would be reading it and they go, well, I'm a PK and I don't use cuss word. That's a preacher's kid. I said, James Baldwin was a preacher. He wasn't just a PK. He was a preacher at 12. <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, they're so late. And so one time I went to, somebody asked me to do uh it was some kind of cultural thing. And it was when Scandal first came out. And all these people were sitting around talking about how wrong it was for her to be with a married man. I go, you know this is fiction, right? <laughs> this isn't anything real. This is fiction. So think of it like that. Think about it as the first black woman doing this. I say, it's fiction. Fiction is not, is it true, but could it be true? But they, they, they just couldn't grasp. And it was like, who are these people? You, you it's know. a way to do a thought experiment. Yeah, and they're so conventional and so conservative, black, you know, black people. Well, I had, I had a professor who said that the Germans were forced to reckon with what the, what the prior generations had done. They were forced to. Oh, yeah. But, um, but no one has ever forced me to right. reckon with what my ancestors Because it, the, in Germany, they start teaching the Holocaust in the first grade. And in here, they try real hard not to teach slavery, pretending, you know, the propaganda. Oh, they were nice and they were taken care of. And, you know, Sally was happy, you know, th that. So it's a different kind of narrative. Isabel Wilkerson has this great book called Cast. Yes, I'm listening to it. Isn't it great? So she does these three countries, um, India, U.S., and Germany, and talks about the caste system. And she said, and I totally agree with her. She said people often misuse race when it's caste. And she, she said, but, but it's like that all the time. You, you know, like if you're a black person, well, you're expected to know. Like I was saying something about Atlanta, and the woman asked me, did I know someone? And I said, well, I haven't lived there in 40 years. Oh, okay. I, I, and it was like, so it's, it's all these little assumptions. But if they got to know somebody, um, it would be different. Like I got a call from Marcus's old school, Paideia, in Atlanta. The, the Pat Conroy, you know the writer? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, okay, so they're our friends. So uh, Megan said, call Ethel. And, of course, they're not in school there. They're, they're Marcus's age. And the, st the students called me, and they said, well, we wonder if you talk to us. They said, Ethel, race situation is so bad. So I said, really? This is a school found by hippies? And she said, yeah, no more. They're Trumpsters. So I went on Black Paideia, and the kid, the, the, the black boy, oh, for Black History Month, I'm going to eat some niggas. A teacher telling a child, a student, she doesn't belong there. Ooh. So I write up this report. I read everything I could find. And I said, there's a problem here. And I think it starts with faculty. But it starts, it, actually, it's the headmaster. Uh, because Paideia is one of the only sc private schools in Atlanta that's not affiliated with a church. And so Atlanta has changed since the 60s, you know. <laughs> I'll say. So, yeah, exactly. So... It's a horrible place. One of our friends, Matt, went to Paideia with Marcus. He's a judge in DeKalb County, and he said he would never send his kids there because it's, you know, people who have money now. So, so when I, so the black kid, I wanted to have a meeting with the parents of the, these black kids because I don't think the parents know what's going on. Mm -hmm. you, you know, like, but the black kids, are, they, they need to be a little tougher. You know, like, if somebody... I remember this young woman came into my office and she was just crying because somebody said to call her a nigger. And I go, so? I said, she was, she was, well, what was I supposed to do? You're supposed to turn around and say, is that all the fuck you got? And keep going. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can't give people your power. I said, do you think Rosa Parks needed Xanax to do her work? You, you know what I mean? It's just like, oh, please. But the parents are keeping these kids too soft. There, it, it, I don't often quote Chris Rock. <laughs> okay. Chris Rock said, we tell our girls every morning, in this house, you love, we care. When you go out, 
Nobody loves you. Nobody cares. And that's and then I, I was saying this in this white woman go, Oh, that's so harsh. I go, and I go, Yeah, but it's true. That's what you need to tell them. You, you need to tell them the truth that this is how the world perceives you. It doesn't mean you're supposed to perceive yourself that way, but you need to be aware of how, because these little kids, they come to school and oh, they break up with their boyfriends and the doctor gives them stuff. Somebody calls them and, you know, it's like, no, you need to remember this. So you, you won't make the same mistake. Yeah, and one kid, well, they said, I got in because of affirmative action. I said, this is WVU. Everybody gets in, number one. <laughs> and I go, and number two, white people use, it has affirmative action too. It's just called white privilege. You, you know, they, they need some skills. And the parents think they're paying all this money that they're getting all that they need. And yeah, so I would like to have a meeting with these parents. Oof. Yeah. But see, when we grew up, the parents and the and the teachers work together. If you got in trouble at home, then there was going to be a blue Buick in your driveway, and you know you were in trouble. That would be the teacher telling you, you know. Yeah, it, it, now it, it's like one time a kid told me, he said, I don't feel good. And I said, well, I don't feel good either, but I'm still here or something. He says, if you don't leave me alone, I'll tell my mom. She'll sue you for everything you got, including your Toyota. <laughs> like, Ooh, I come for your Toyota. You know, yeah, but it was like, what? I was so shocked, you know? It was like, we, uh, what? <laughs> oh, no, I am so thrilled not to be teaching. But also, Marcus is a male. Males get, te teach, get treated differently than females, no, no matter what the race is. Because ah, they're, they're, they're programmed. Yeah. That's yeah. true. Um, in South Africa, they referred to uh, the, the commission, the transition, as truth and reconciliation. Yeah. I know somebody who worked on that committee. Yeah. And what I always say is first comes truth, mm -hmm. and that in the United States of America, in my view, we haven't even gotten to truth, mm -mm. and we're already talking about reparations. Exactly. But you know, it, this guy who wrote, oh, I get so sick of people writing on Facebook uh, using Martin Luther King as the model demonstrator. And I go, what the hell are you talking about? You killed him. You killed him too. <laughs> so this way guy, I didn't kill him. <laughs> and all white people didn't kill him. I go, yeah, just like all white people didn't kill George Floyd, right? So he started ranting, ranting. So some other people got involved with it. Uh, so I think he went to sleep mad and woke up the next day. He came back with something. And he was telling me what I should do. I said, here's the deal. You have three options. Don't read what I post. Unfriend me. But don't you ever tell me what to do. Are we clear? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't care. All white people didn't kill. And it was like, we know all white people didn't kill um, Martin Luther King. But white people did kill it. You know, when black people do something, it's all black people. You, you know, they can't tell them apart. You, you know, no, 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 I didn't care. It's just like, please. Yeah. What, what, what gives you hope? What gives you hope? Let me see. Well, we haven't had hope in a long time. How about now, today? Oh, yeah, today's better than it's been in a long time. What gives you hope? Oh, I don't know. It used to be good students. You know, you have those students who are really good, who worked really hard and didn't whine about stuff and was real thrilled to be in school. You know what I mean? Uh, well, I ask you about a teacher that made a difference in your life, that note on the blue stationery, yeah, yeah, yeah. that made a difference. Are there students who come to you who are still friends of yours who oh, say yeah. you were the person? Well, when Toni Morrison died, I was so surprised. I heard from so many students and they said, oh my God, this reminded of you of us, reminded us of you and remember how you taught us to read her? I read other books. That's the thing about teaching. You don't know who you touch. You, you know, you, you have these bad days, 
And I don't know. I've got I got a letter from a guy. He was a he's a cop. And he said, and they, they always start this, dear Professor Smith. I know you don't remember me. I was in your class, and I sat in the back. Yada 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 yada. Uh, but oh, he said, some of the things you taught me were so important that I had no idea about. And a lot of them will say that. Uh, or I had a great white cop. Yeah, in, a in white West cop. Uh huh. Wrote you a letter. Mm -hmm. How and long I, ago? Oh, I think before I moved up here, and, he had been one of my students. And so. What was it that you taught him that he said was so important to him? Uh, about not judging people uh, by one stereotype, you know. There's this great 15-minute uh, TED Talk, and it's by Achikamana, the African writer, and it's like one, one, one time, one verse or something won't do it. You have to get to know people. And people often, people get their information from television and from their friends, as opposed to reading books and talking to people. That, that, that's what people don't do, is talk to people. How, how did you get to be so strong? How did you get to be? Well, just, you don't have choices. You just, you have to do this. You have a kid. You have to take care of your kid. You have to send a kid to school. You have to do this. Oh, and, and I was always, <laughs> I remember one time I wanted Marcus. No, but you seem to be self. Well, now, because I'm older. But I remember, um, oh, Marcus used to play tennis and soccer. So he, he was recruited by the tennis players. So there was a camp at Georgia Tech. And I didn't have any money. So I said, mm, I need to get him in that camp. So I wrote the like a post-dated check or something and sent Merkins on his way. So that night, the coach called and I go, oh, he's not going to go for my post-dated check. So he said, uh, Mrs. Smith, I said, yes, uh, I'd like to invite Marcus for the second session. And I go, oh, okay. I said, but as you can see, we can't afford the first session. He said, oh, I just tore that little check up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you now, do have people along the way. Yeah, and you, well, I knew Marcus was a good tennis player. If he hadn't been a good tennis player, I wouldn't have sent him with a post dated check. <laughs> you know what I mean? I go, yeah, yeah. So that was so funny. We, we, we still laugh about that. Yeah. Marcus said, Mom, I remember one time you came home and go, Marcus, you have to go to France this summer because I don't have enough food to feed you. <laughs> And Is I go, that true? No, he went to he France. And, well, he went to France and stayed with a family for for a summer. Yeah, but and he that made up that little story. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Go, That's not true. Yeah. <laughs> well, it helped his French. So anyway, that was funny because they 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 were Bordeaux. They spoke very little English. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I want to say thank you. Oh, you're so good. For educating Marcus. <laughs> thank you for educating countless others, and thank you for schooling me. <laughs> that is cool. You, you're, you're pretty schooling school. schooling me for just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. Uh, so this is, I'm so, I don't know people who go around and do podcasts anymore. Yeah. Well, you know me. I know, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> this is new. This is impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Now, you sure you don't want any water to take with you or anything? Maybe water. And Ethel Smith got me a bottle of water, and we put our masks back on, and we stayed far away from one another, and I hit the road for New Orleans. And um, I am so pleased and grateful to have met her and that she shared some time. I really wanted to just camp out and talk, talk shop with her. Ethel, thank you so much. Man Listening is a production of Unmediated LLC in cooperation with the Queen City Podcast Network and Balto Creative Media. Allison Andrews at Andrews Creative and Rachel Clapp Miller are developmental producers. Sally Higgins at Higgins and Owens tries to keep us legal. Our music is A Day at the Park by the group Pictures of the Floating World. Your announcer is Catherine Smith. That's me. Please go to our Patreon page. You'll find us at patreon.com. Look for Man Listening, one word, no spaces. We hope you'll join us by becoming a member. A small investment can raise up the conversation. If you want exclusive member merch, like a t-shirt, we can arrange that too.
I want to let you know that by the end of this year, we're closing in on 15,000 downloads for Man Listening, and I owe that all to you guys. So thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. Don't forget to support us at Patreon. We believe one voice can change the conversation. Click the subscribe button, and next week you'll hear... I talk to uh, my daughter about that a lot, that you have to know when you have to walk away. Maybe you don't need that person to get where you need to go. That's next week on Man Listening. Thanks.